I'm going to, well, I'm going to introduce my um, presentation in a second. I just want to say hi and just give you a very brief background on me. I'm a, a, a psychotherapist. I live in um, New York City, and my focus is on um, working with, with um, patients, uh, caregivers, family members, uh, people who are living with a um, chronic or catastrophic um, health condition. And I have a lot of cancer patients, a lot of, um, I call them prostate guys, but a lot of prostate cancer patients in my practice. And I probably, of that group, I probably see as many of their kids and their wives as, as, I, do the, <clears throat> as I do the men themselves. I want to very briefly mention I used to, in another life, many years ago, worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I worked on the uh, advertising marketing side of, uh, of drugs. Ask your doctor about Procrit. And um, you must remember that. That was one of, my, uh, one of my counts. And in the process of that, I did a lot of interviews and um, groups with um, patients and caregivers and doctors. And I had my own business doing that for a while. Very quickly get to a point here was I recognized that people would come to me, I would interview them on something we called the patient's journey, and at the end of the hour, on the way out, people would shake my hand, and they would say, thank you for this, and I would say, well, you know, everybody can use 100 bucks, you're welcome. They would say, no, no, it's not about the 100 bucks I'm gonna get. Nobody has ever talked to me about how I feel. Nobody has ever said, what's it like to have cancer? What do you deal with? How do you make decisions? Nobody's ever asked me those questions. I was a, um, I did some volunteering for a while for an organization in New York that provided uh, temporary housing, a bed and breakfast for um, patients coming in to New York for treatment from other areas of the country, other countries as well. And one of the things I would do would be a check-in to help them check into the apartment and get them acclimated to life in New York and so forth. And um, I once checked in a, a family, it was, um, a guy probably in his maybe around 70, early 70s, and his wife and um, his son and daughter-in-law and, and their child came. They were taking over the apartment for a few days. And, um, and I introduced myself, how you doing? So what are you here for? So well, I'm here for some, uh, I'm gonna be at Sloan Kettering, I have prostate cancer. And, um, and I said, so how, how are you doing? And immediately his daughter said, he's fine. She walked away. The husband followed the child into the living room and turned the TV on, full blast. Okay, there's a message here. He started to talk, and his wife said, stop complaining, he's, he's fine. She walked away, and he looked at me and he said, this is what I deal with. <laughs> and you know, that was it, somewhere in the, along the way, I just decided this needed to be my life's work to help people talk about living with chronic and, and catastrophic illness. So, that's where I found myself about 10 years ago. I have a website, which is up here. And so this is just kind of my life's work. And what I, so I'm so thrilled with the opportunity to actually have a chance to talk to you about emotions and, and um, some of the psychosocial issues that people deal with when they're living with, um, with prostate cancer. So again, it's an honor to be here. I'm gonna ask you just to take one second and do just a little breathing. This is something I do with my clients a lot because when we're thinking and we're multitasking, our breath is up, <laughs> we're like this. So what I ask clients to do when they come into the room, and just a chance for you, this is something you can use later on, no extra charge for this. It's, a, um, it's called diaphragmatic breathing, and it's just kind of sitting up straight. We're not gonna belabor this. Sitting up straight and just breathing in through your nose. Ex Inhaling through your mouth. You might notice when you put your hand here and here, your chest stays here, your stomach sticks out because we're taking the air in through the diaphragm. What's important about this? It relaxes you. It's a great stress reliever. So in through the nose. I have a little asthma, so you might hear me wheeze. Out through the, out through the mouth. It's, a great, again, a great way to, 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 to de-stress. Second thing I'm going to do is promise you that I am neurotic about time, and we are going to be done by 12.15, no matter what it takes. I might speak a little faster into the end, but we'll be done by 12.15. I promise that, too. Nobody will have to get up here and, and pull me off the, the podium. We're going to talk about the, the, the toll that cancer takes. I'll be preaching to the choir at that point. It will be a quick review, I promise. We'll talk about the elephants in the room, which I think are kind of the, the foundation, something key to think about here. We're gonna talk about depression, how to help, and then resilience and resilience tools. 
and when the going gets tough. So what I'm hoping is that you're going to get a broad education, as much as I can do for you in, a, in an hour today. I'm going to be around all afternoon if you want to talk to me. I'm going to give you my email address at the end, and you can email me or call me as well. If there's anything I can do to help you after this, I welcome you to, to get in touch with me. This is my mission. Hoping that, that I can help you to help members that you might have in your chapter who might be experiencing some emotional problems, some um, depression. And, and then give you some resilience tools that you can use, but also that you can pass on. So what I think, basically, is that helping somebody who's having some emotional issues around prostate cancer is two things. One is directly intervening where you can. And secondly, is very subtly teaching basic resilience 101, stress management, that you can always kind of introduce. Um, with, with, with um, members or family members as well, so kind of, kind of from two approaches. One thing is that you know already is that cancer takes a toll. There's, a, there's lifestyle management, just changing the way that you, that you live, the way that you eat, the way that you move, everything about your life changes. Lingering side effects, as we've all, you've been talking about for a long time, today, yesterday and today. Important that, that psychologists use is called loss of role. And when you have a, a chronic condition or a catastrophic condition, you lose a role. That role may be being the person who's always in charge, the person who always tells everybody else what to do, the person who doesn't need any help. That's a role. All of a sudden, you lose that role. And there are bigger roles that get lost. Sometimes people are unable to work or have to make serious. Uh, changes in life. There are roles that we had that we value, that we use to identify ourselves. We lose some of those roles, and that can be traumatizing. And just adjusting to change. Human beings are not hardwired to change. We're wired to stay the same. And an, a, a chronic illness introduces lots of changes that we didn't ask for. It's an uninvited house guest. It moves in, it takes over, and then it wants breakfast in bed. We got to change our life to accommodate it, right? Cancer takes the tolls on emotions and relationships. One is fear of the future, and we're going to talk about that in different ways today. Fear of the future comes out in, in it's, it's, a, it's a recognition what I had planned, the way that I would live, is going to change. And that can be scary. And then there is ongoing getting medical tests every year, six months. So there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear about the future. Uncertainty, we don't do well with uncertainty. And just overall stress, stress coming from all, all directions. I'm going to let you meet a few of my clients, which I have kind of uh, sort of clustered together. I've had a few clients in age 46, 47, 48, 50s, early 50s with prostate cancer. And the way I would characterize these guys is, I don't know how to move forward. I feel like I don't have a future. That's a shock, as, as many of you know or know from other people, to have a diagnosis of prostate cancer in your late 40s, early 50s. I have a, I have a very good friend who had a prostate, um, a prostate cancer diagnosis. He's a few years younger than I am when he was, I think, 49. And, and it was a shock, came, up, came out of the blue. I had a client two nights, two nights ago, and I told him after I talked to him, I said, you just primed me for my weekend. He's um, 38. His father has prostate cancer. And what he said, his dad has totally shut down. We don't know how to reach him. He's in what I call, he's in what I call freeze mode. He's going through the treatment because his family is making sure he does. His family's done the research. His wife has done the research. They're pushing him through it. He's completely shut down. He won't talk about it. He won't deal with it. He's completely shut down. And then a, a, a guy named Doug, again, a kind of a, a sort of a conglomeration of clients, he said, I'll tough it out. I've been toughing out my whole life. I'm going to tough it out. I'll take care of this myself. Don't bother me. Just very quickly, just a few of the numbers. Men are four times more likely than women to commit suicide. I'm, going to, I'm leading into more serious depression. At any given time, 20 to 60% of men with prostate cancer may suffer from anxiety. 
Depression has been strongly correlated to fatigue and pain as symptoms in prostate cancer. So with fatigue and pain come depression. Partner's risk for psychological distress is as high or higher than in patients. I was really happy to hear women being addressed um, earlier on. Women are going through a lot with this also. Men with prostate cancer and depression have been shown to have lower survival rates. That was a very recent study done at UCLA. And a lot of this, the message here is a lot of this depression, anxiety, is not being treated. Men are walking wounded. They're walking around with this and not getting any help with it. So I'm going to introduce you to some of the elephants in the room. They're, they're wandering around the house and nobody's talking about them. That's why they're elephants. I'm going to make a, give you a list of them. Anger, guilt, disappointment, fear. And I gave you the example earlier on about my, my, the family that I was checking into the apartment. Lots of elephants in the room there. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody wants to talk about how scared they are. Nobody wants to talk about how disappointed that this happened to their family. Nobody wants to talk about how guilty they feel that they're not talking about it. And, 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 and the anger. We're going to talk more about anger. It's an important thing to talk about when you talk about men and, and, and emotions. And the biggest element is helplessness. I'm not here to tell you that you're helpless, but I am saying that one of the emotions, feelings, reactions that that people deal with when they're dealing with a diagnosis like cancer is they feel helpless. They didn't ask for this. They don't want it. They don't want to deal with it. They want it to go away, and they want to have their life back to the way it was. They feel helpless. Why is this happening to me? Why, why me? And I think that everybody's feeling it, and everybody at home, everybody in the house is feeling it. Nobody really wants to admit it, but it keeps showing up. It's there in this big, ugly, pink, pink elephant. Look at it this way. If you didn't feel helpless, you wouldn't be so focused on getting control. And I'm going to talk a lot about the control thing as we go forward, too. It's a big issue with men. Define the battle. And unfortunately, so often it is a battle internally and within family members. Humans want to know. We want to control. We want to know what's going on. We want to fix it. We want to, and so do family members. Everybody wants to fix it. We want to control ourselves and others to predict. We want to judge. We want life to go the way it should go. And this is certainly a guy thing. You know, guys are raised. You're the masters of your own destiny. Suck it up and make it happen, right? How many times did you get told that? Suck it up here. Make it happen. You're in charge. That's ingrained. It's hardwired in men and women. And all of a sudden, a chronic condition steps in and says, well, yeah, not really. You know, not really. The result, confusion, frustration, disappointment, anger, fear. What I say is you've already lost the battle. You're not in control. But maybe it doesn't have to be in ba a battle. And what I say to my clients is once you recognize that you don't have control, then you can see where, where you do have control. Recognize where you are helpless. You can start to look at where, you, where, you, where you're in not helpless. I want to talk about depression. I'm going to slow down a little bit now and talk about depression with you. Very, really important consideration, important topic that comes up with chronic conditions. <clears throat> Some of the signs and symptoms are physical, they're emotional, and they're cognitive. And what, what I would encourage you to do when I talk about depression symptoms is to think about members that might be in your chapter, and maybe some of the behaviors that, that they might demonstrate, what you might notice. Also, what you may have noticed in yourself in the past or, 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 or present. I'm going to start by talking about physical symptoms of depression. You notice that these are in red. They're red because they're, they're symptoms that men are, are likely to experience who are living with prostate cancer. One is fatigue, loss of energy. Now, I recognize that a lot of this relates to the treatment. But fatigue, loss of energy is, can also be a symptom of depression. And when someone's experiencing fatigue, loss of energy as part of their treatment, this can enhance depression as well. They can go hand in hand. Too much sleep, too little sleep can be a symptom of depression. 
Stomach ache, back ache, sometimes men do what's called somatizing. They feel their symptoms in their, in their body, partly because they don't want to admit it up here. Substance abuse, having a few, few extra drinks can be a, a way of coping. It's called self-medicating. It can be a way of coping with depression but not recognizing it. Weight loss, weight gain, changes in appetite, I recognize can also be related to treatment, but can also be symptoms of depression. Or Again, they can go hand in hand. There's a lot of what's called comorbidity here with, with um, prostate cancer, treatment, depression. Some of the emotional symptoms. Men who are experiencing depression can be really irritable. We'll talk a little bit more about anger in a minute. Irritability, don't bother me with this. Why are you bothering me with that? Why are you talking to me about that? Irritability, anger, hostility, anxiety. Part of depression is, not, is, is fearing the depression, not wanting to, to admit that you're depressed. That can really cause anxiety. Again, they go hand in hand. Feelings of worthlessness or guilt. Again, loss of role. If I can't do this, I must be worthless. If I'm not able to participate actively, what good am I anymore? And you hear a lot of that thinking. I hear that a lot from men who are living with uh, illness of some kind, cancer. I'm useless to everybody. What good am I anymore? Sadness. And men may try to hide these feelings. Men are often not so upfront when they're feeling sadness. And just a sense of emptiness. Again, that what, what use am I anymore? Cognitive symptoms, difficulty concentrating, again, which I know can be related to treatment as well. Indecisiveness, uh, thoughts of self-harm. Again, some of these notice thoughts of self-harm is in red. Men who, who the, the, if the depression continues to compound, they can start to become self-harming in different ways. Loss of interest or pleasure in life, things that used to be fun. When my father had cancer, one of the first, as he got further down the road, one of the things that went away was going downstairs to his workshop. I don't really like to do that anymore. Well, why not? I don't know. It's just not fun anymore. Difficulty meeting responsibilities as well. Difficulty holding up their end. Again, because just feeling just not motivated. Again, can all, can all be related to treatment, I understand, so I want to make that distinction, but can also be related to depression as well. What causes depression? Life events like stress, like lack of, lack of coping skills can cause depression. Biochemical imbalance. Sometimes depression can be the result of a biochemical imbalance. Sometimes families have depression. I have clients who depression goes back three or four generations in their family, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter. Sometimes people who are, have biochemical cause depression can be sailing through life, kind of, you know, never, kind of like Eeyore, kind of a sad sack. But a life event, like a diagnosis, will send them over the edge and the depression will deepen. They may not realize they had, a bio, had biochemical depression until the life event of the cancer diagnosis occurred. I have stress on here twice because stress is big. Sometimes just plain old stress can, can cause depression as well. A mental health professional can make that determination and, and, can, and can recommend treatment, which I'll, I'll talk about going forward. There's a depression mindset that sets in. And these are things, again, as chapter leaders, as friends of individuals with prostate cancer, family members, to watch out for. One is self-sabotage, which is kind of sort of holding yourself back to avoid disappointment. I don't want to try. I'm just going to be disappointed. And I hear this. I had, a, a, again, a, a, a client with, a, who had just been diagnosed with prostate cancer. His doctor had sent me in my way. And I said, what do you, what do you, are, you, are you getting second opinions? Are you talking to support groups? Are you getting out and seeing what's out there in terms of the treatment option? Well, no, I don't really. You know, I, I just, I'm just going to get disappointed. I, I don't want to have too much hope here. That's called self-sabotage. I don't want to be disappointed, so I, I'm not really going to try. Birds of a feather. People who are depressed often seek other depressed people out who will reinforce that. You may find sometimes at a meeting three or four guys who are really down 
pretty downhearted will get together and cluster together, birds of a feather. They will reinforce each other's depression. So one of the things I recommend for depressed clients is meet new people, get out, you know, get some other people in your life. Helpless, hopeless is the hallmark symptom of depression, just feeling helpless and hopeless, giving up, and anger. A few words about anger. I never talk to a group of men about emotions when I don't talk about anger because anger is a basic emotion. If you walk into a nursery and a baby is drinking from her bottle, his or her bottle, and you pull that bottle away, what happened? Screaming. That baby is angry. You took the bottle away. That's a primary emotion, right? The baby's ticked off. However, Anger can also become what's called a covering emotion. It covers up other emotions, like sadness and like fear. And I find this with men. When men are feeling sad, when they're feeling scared, when they're feeling disappointment, they tend to get angry. It comes out in, in anger. And it's just kind of a, it's a guy thing. I think men are, anger is reinforced. Angry behavior is reinforced by our culture in men. Sadness, disappointment, neediness, is not reinforced in men. So I say to my clients, ask yourself, am I really angry or am I just feeling really helpless? That's pretty scary. I should be in control, but I'm not. That's pretty sad. Anger directed inward, as anger builds up, at some point if you direct it inward, excuse me, that can turn into depression. So depression can be anger directed inward, leads to depression. Why don't men get treated for depression very quickly? Cultural expectations. We live in a macho culture. Men are supposed to be strong, silent types. There's still a stigma around treatment for depression. Oh, you're seeing a shrink, huh? Oh, you're on uh, antidepressants. Did you take your meds today? Ha, ha, ha. Expectations of control. Men should be in control. They shouldn't need treatment. Denial. I can take care of myself. I don't need this. The risk is that depression is often overlooked in men, and it's, it's all too often left untreated. So I'm going to give you some ideas about how to help. And as a friend, as a family member, um, as a chapter leader, here's some ideas of things that you can do for someone who you think may be experiencing dep depression. First, the question is, why won't guys talk? I mean, that's a whole, that's, that's, that's probably a five-day seminar on why men won't talk. So I just have a few minutes for it today. Um, but talking about feelings is considered weak. Men don't like to appear what they feel is, is, is being weak. Talking about feelings is unfamiliar. Men in our culture often don't really know how to talk about feelings. They haven't been taught to sit down and say, I feel this way, I feel that. One of the things I do if I have couples come in, as I say, I want you to practice five minutes today talking about how you feel. It's going to feel really weird and stupid, but you have to do it anyway. Five minutes, talk about how you feel. Men often don't know how to articulate their feelings. Feelings can feel dangerous and get out of control. If I talk about feelings, I might start crying. I might, this, I might let loose this floodgate, and then I might disappear, or I might collapse, or I might... Uh, it might just take over. You know, those feelings can be scary when they just keep building up. And again, I hear this from guys, I need to be strong for the people around me. My wife is really suffering. My kids are really suffering over this. I have to be strong for them. I'm trying to help them. So who doesn't get helped in the process is the person who's, who's living with the diagnosis. One idea that I find helpful in, in, in trying to reach out to someone who may be experiencing depression is to approach them gently. Don't go in and say, you need to, or tell them what they need, tell them what they have to do, or, or here's what I think's going on with you. When I say, when someone approaches me and says, you need to, automatically the wall goes up. I don't need to do anything, please. Don't start, right? The wall goes up. Or, you know what I think is wrong with you? The wall goes up. Ask for permission. Can I talk to you about something? I want to bring something up with you. Do you mind? Is that okay? Get the other person's permission. Does that make sense? 
start out gently, and the person may say no, then you can say, okay, no problem. Open the dialogue. No, be transparent. I want to talk to you about something that I'm concerned about. I want to talk about how you're coping. I just want to know how you're doing. I'm, co I'm concerned about how you're doing. Again, you're gently trying to kind of chip away at that wall that, that, that we all have. Again, stay tentative. The other person can say, I'm doing pretty well. I don't really want to go into this with you. OK, fine. You tried. There's some other ways. We'll, figure, we'll talk about this later. One approach. Keep it tentative. I always encourage um, people to cite evidence, to be specific when you approach somebody about a concern that you have about them, what you've observed. I just want to talk about something that I noticed lately. I noticed that you used to always talk about your projects, and I don't hear you talking about projects anymore. Or I said to my dad, you used to go to the workshop all the time. Why don't you go down there anymore? Or I've noticed that you kind of stick into yourself. You used to be the life of the party here. You've been kind of keeping to yourself lately. I noticed that. I noticed this. I saw that. When I see that, it concerns me. You're not, you're not yourself. You're not, the, you're not the person that I know. I'm not an expert here. I'm not a psychiatrist. But I notice that with some of the other members, when, when they behave this way, they might be depressed. OK, you see what I've done? I've cited evidence. And then I've said, based on my observations or my experience, when someone behaves this way, they might be feeling some depression. There might be something going on. Again, is what we say in healthcare these days, evidence-based. And then provide some education. I'm not an expert in depression, but I've had a little training in how depression works. I went to a workshop at the US2 meeting, and this guy talked about depression. He kind of educated us a little bit. Can I talk to you about that a little bit? I'm not an expert here, but I know a little bit. Can I talk to you about that? Again, you've invited yourself in a little bit more into the doorway. Now you've asked to sit down in the living room. The other person may say, no, I think I know all about that. OK, fine. Give the option to say no. But if somebody's willing to hear more, give them a little overview. The guy talked about physical symptoms. I noticed that you this. He talked about emotional. He talked about behavioral. He talked about mental. I noticed this. So again, a little education. People always appreciate, appreciate and not always, but often appreciate being educated. It's not just you psyching them out. It's the data, the information. Always emphasize that depression is normal. I say to my clients, if you weren't sad and downhearted and frustrated and angry, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised at you if you weren't. Look what you're dealing with. It's normal. Don't push. You may bring this topic up two or three or four times. You may look for teachable moments. You know, I noticed this a minute ago. You know, I was kind of talking to you about how you're feeling. Do you want to talk? Be patient. And again, the old, the old uh, saying, we can't control how other people choose to think or behave. We can't control other people. We can't fix people. At some point, trying to fix other people is more about your helplessness and not theirs. So keep that in mind. At some point, when I'm trying to fix you and change your behavior, I have to ask, is this, part, is this about me or is this about you? Is this about you at that point? Do watch that. Too much. Don't turn this into a power struggle, in other words. Too much pressure can alienate somebody else from what they really need is just support and just you being there. And I've had people say, all I needed was somebody just to be there and know they were watching over me. Now, you may bring this up with somebody, and they may just go, but you know what? You, you, you triggered something. They know they're being watched. They know somebody else is concerned about them and worried about them. They may come to you at some point and say, you know, you brought this up a while back and I jumped down your throat. Sorry about that. Maybe we can talk about it. So you're planting seeds here. Have resources available. If, you, if, you, if you're a part of a chapter or just even on your own, if you have pamphlets about emotional um, 
issues, depression, if you have uh, local numbers, if you have websites, if you have mine, if you ever need it. Offer resources, but again, don't force them. We can't force ourselves on other people. And men and emotions is a really risky territory. Men get very defensive when you bring up emotions. So again, I would just say, you know, take it, take it easy. Some of the resources really quickly <clears throat> might include um, the VA. It might include um, if somebody has health insurance, they can go to, the, go to their website to the health insurance company. There's a behavioral health provider list. There's community mental health. There's local university mental health clinics. If it's, if it's overwhelming, there's the local emergency rooms. There's a lot of resources. And just doing a good Google on the name of your community and mental health, you're going to come up with quite a bit. Leave the door open. And there's a whole issue of readiness here. If a member is not ready to have this conversation, back off, because he may be at a later time. Again, you've, you've planted a seed. You can say, just want to leave the door open. I'm here if you want to talk. I'd like to keep talking about it. And then, and then back off. Now, I'm going to get some shaking heads at this point based on what I've been hearing. But one, one of the old standbys is mental health, mental health, in mental health, is to suggest that a patient, that a person, a friend, a member, talk to their doctor. Now, I know you're going to say, the doctor's going to say, I don't care about this. Don't bother me with it. There are a lot of doctors, physicians, who are mental health friendly and recognize that their patients are probably going to have some mental health issues. And a lot of doctors have resources. Most of my clients come to me from doctors who have my name and somebody who's dealing with um, their treatment, having some mental health issues, or just newly diagnosed, will get my name and phone number. So it's an option. I know you're going to say a lot of these doctors don't want to talk about mental health. I understand that. But a lot of doctors do and are willing to. It's worth the conversation. Sometimes men don't trust anybody except their doctors to talk about these issues if they talk about them with anybody. So it's an option. And there are a lot of doctors out there, out there, out there who really have become more mental health friendly. Again, be aware of, your own, uh, aware of your own reactions. Other people's behavior triggers something in us. And sometimes a person's situation will remind us of a situation that we've been in, and we want to fix ourselves by fixing that other person. So just be careful when you're helping somebody with their mental health issues that this doesn't become your story and not their story. Again, fixing our, we can't fix other people. We can't fix ourselves by fixing other people. So just, just be careful about that. <clears throat> Good on timing. I'm going to talk about some resilience tools now. That So I gave you the overview of depression and mental health issues. I talked to you about how you might actually approach someone who is um, emotionally <clears throat> having some emotional problems depression. Now I'm going to talk about some tools that I think you can subtly use in your own life as well as with other people, maybe chapter members, and, and help them on kind of an ongoing basis. Okay, So we had the direct approach. Now we're kind of moving to the indirect approach. I want to talk very briefly about the grief process. <clears throat> A few years ago, I took some training in grief counseling, and I think that that training taught me more about helping people with catastrophic and chronic illness than any other training I got. Because I recognize that in many ways, this is a grieving process that someone goes through when they have a medical diagnosis. They grieve. Remember that a medical condition introduces change. It's the uninvited house guest. We don't like change very much. And it introduces loss, loss of role, loss of daily routines that we love, a lot of different kinds of loss. When we lose something important, we go through a grieving process. We grieve that loss. Grief is a process. It's unique to every one of us. We each go through our own grieving process. So that's something just to keep in mind that, that these guys coming into your chapter, into your life in some way, are grieving. The way they thought they were going to live their life got taken away 
and the twinkling of an eye when they walked into the doctor's office and the doctor says, I have to talk to you about your test results. The way they thought life was going to be changed. And, we're, and they're in the process of grieving that. It's a grief process. As we grieve, we prepare for the next chapter in our, in our life. We learn how resilient we are, but it's also an opportunity to become more resilient as well. So I just want to ask you to keep in mind that this is a grieving process. And I'm sure many of you can relate to that, what it was like to grieve when you, when you got that diagnosis. Along with depression comes and can come anxiety, sometimes what's called suicidal ideation, thoughts of self-harm. And even PTSD, the research is showing that a, a medical diagnosis can be a traumatic experience. It can be horrifying, terrifying, which can result in what's called post-traumatic stress disorder as well, which can be an even more intense um, emotional reaction. One of the things I tell my clients, and this is something that you can do with, with friends and chapter members, is, is to review your foundation. And I do this with all of my clients. Sometimes the first session, I'll say, what's your foundation? What's that look like? What are your coping skills? What gives you pleasure in life? What's your support network like? What are your life management skills? There are certain parts of us, our inner core, that nobody and no diagnosis can take away from us. There's a core that each one of us has. Nobody can take that away. And sometimes I'll have clients go home and make a list. Make a list of what your foundation looks like and bring it back and we'll talk about it. Then I want you to carry it in your back pocket. When you're feeling really crummy, I want you to pull that out and remember what your foundation is, what's there. And spirituality, it's a combination. Everybody has their own. It's, what's your foundation? Make yourself a priority. It's a kind of a, a lot of little how-tos right now. And I find that, that, that men have trouble making themselves a priority. And I think part of being a resilient person is to be aware of what do you need to be at your best? What do you need to take care of yourself so you can take better care of the other people in your life? What do you need to do for yourself? What's your own self-care routine have to look like? And then I'll give you some ideas of what that might include. One, another idea for resilience, resilience is to have a plan B. And I find that one of the elephants in the room is, what, is the what if, doing all the what ifing. And so I, I encourage clients to sit down and say, let's put together a plan B then. Let's sit down and talk about what if this happened? What if that happened? What are the things that scare you? And, we, I, and I think clients who are living with a catastrophic or a chronic condition often walk around with this vague sense of something horrible might happen. I don't want to think about it. So it's, again, it's, it's kind of an elephant. It's sort of a dark shadow that's following them, but they don't really sit down and think about what that would mean. And it might mean sitting down, doing some financial planning. It might be sitting down and talking about if, if I had, um, if I was laid up for a while with treatment, who would we call in? Who could help out? Who would help my wife if she needed help? And, and, and this involves the partners talking about what, what would the plan be. And to really sit down and map that out, that's a really uncomfortable discussion to have. But I find that once clients have had that discussion, they feel a lot better. They feel like, OK, we talked about the elephant in the room, that one we have a plan in place, and that can give a certain comfort level. Again, it's part of being resilient. Letting go of the need to be controlled, this, of, of the need to be in control and to control. This is something we all, I suspect, go through every day. Something br brings up an issue, boy, I'm not in control here. And I find that this is a daily struggle for men living with chronic conditions, is that need to be in control. And I think, again, it's the idea of uncertainty recognizing that life is uncertainty. I say to my clients, I'm at a, my office is at a really busy corner uh, intersection, and I say to my clients, I think I'm gonna get home fine tonight. I'm gonna be careful, I'm gonna look both ways, I'm gonna make sure there's not a biker or a skateboarder heading towards me even though I have the walk light. 
I'm going to hope a cab driver doesn't uh, decide to race me for the, for, for the right of way. I'm going to hope that somebody doesn't knock me in the head when I get to the other. I'm going to hope and do my best. That's all I know. I don't know if I'm going to make it home tonight. I'm hopeful, though. I'm going to do everything I can do to make sure I do. This is life. It's uncertain. We just have this moment. And I think just letting go of that need to predict, to judge, to control is probably the greatest lesson. And I have so many, often I have clients tell me, I thought I was in control until I walked into the doctor's office that day. And then I find, found out that life is not very predictable. It's pretty, really pretty random. To take care of yourself physically. And I think it's always a good subtle reminder for people. And this is one of the first things I ask my clients the first time I meet them. Are you eating and are you sleeping? Are you eating healthy, regularly, and are you getting a decent night's sleep? If you take care, care of your body, you're going to be able to think and react a little bit better. Take a break. And I, found that, I find that so often clients get really caught up in taking care of things and pushing themselves and trying to be as active as possible and trying to do this and trying to do that. They're not really taking very good care of themselves. They're not getting an hour just to rest. They're pushing, and it's almost like, it's almost like trying to run away from something. It's like, what are, you, what are you running away from? And they don't really take the time every day to, um, to really sit down and think about their life, to relax, to do something they enjoy that's not just running or pushing themselves. And again, I find that men are often guilty of this. And this is a great way to, to, to get membership in the, in, in the walking wounded. So I encourage everybody to take a break and to give up that idea that they have to be a, a hero. And again, I especially see this with men, that they feel like once I stop pushing myself, then this is all going to catch up with me whatever it is, and, and something bad will happen. I need to keep running. By the way, I'm going to have some time for questions at the end. I have this set up to have a few minutes of questions. So if you have a question at the end, I hope that you'll think about this and ask. So again, I say this to my clients all the time, is don't be a hero. And, and I find with women and with men, for in, in their own roles in their home, they still want to be the hero. I always encourage clients to share the workload. This is another aspect of being resilient. And men don't like to ask for help. They feel like they're the ones that are supposed to doing, be doing everything. So asking other family members to help out. And to be honest with you, the other thing that I also find, for better or worse, is, is that sometimes men are willing to let their wives do all the work and, and let their wives just kind of handle everything. And the research shows, for example, that in most households, women are the medical consumers. They're the ones going on the internet. They're the ones checking out the doctors. They're the ones making the doctor's appointments. And then the women are the ones um, kind of, who kind of take over all the work around the house as well. So I encourage men to get asked for help, but I also encourage men to get help for their wives. And I think part of what happens in couples is that, is that the men feel like, I don't want anybody to know what's going on here, and I want them to think it's life as, as usual, but guess what's happening? The wife has taken over all the work. So it's business as usual with the wife taking on an additional burden. I'm not beating up on anybody here at all, but I do find that, that this often happens. And so what I encourage with men is, is, is ask for help, Share the workload, but don't give it all to your wife. Make sure that she's getting help also. And I, you know, and I might have mentioned that one of the, some, some of my clients are often wives of men with prostate cancer. And the wives need a place to ventilate, to vent, to talk about what's going on. And one of the things that women often express is just not getting a lot of, a lot of emotional support, not getting a lot of hugging and not getting any help. And often they tell me that their, their husbands won't ask the kids for help because they're embarrassed. They don't want to look weak. 
But again, in the process of not looking weak for their children, the wives taking on that much more. So um, children, adult children, know there's something going on and they want to help. And what I tell my clients is that adult children want to be involved in this. They want to be part of the process. And they want to be involved in helping in some way. And they feel helpless to getting everybody involved as a way to, to, to help all the family members not to feel so helpless. <clears throat> Turn off that self-critical voice. And I, I would just ask you to think about, as chapter leaders and as friends, family members, to think about listening for your own critical voice and listening for it in other people and gently pointing it out. We always, we're always in an inner dialogue. I suspect right now you're thinking about the presentation, you're thinking about my slides, you're thinking about lunch, you're thinking about how you're gonna get home, you're thinking about what you're gonna be doing tomorrow, you're thinking about something coming up next week, you're thinking about a lot of things. It's an ongoing dialogue. This is, how, this is how we make sense of things, and, and part of that is to judge and make decisions. This looks good, that looks bad, this looks dangerous, that looks safe, that looks interesting. We're judging all the time. We're also judging ourselves. Why did you say that? Why did you step in front of him when you should have let him go first? Why did you do that? Why did you and that? We're, we're, it's an ongoing dialogue of, of, of judging ourselves. What can happen, is that we can get caught up in a very self-critical voice that's always jumping in and beating up on ourselves. So I'm, I encourage clients to be aware of that self-critical voice. I might even have them go home and jot down and be aware of that voice and jot down what it tells them all the time. Oh, you're stupid. Oh, you should have done that. Oh, my gosh, that looked weak. And then to start to replace. And that's poison. That's toxin, toxic self-talk, to replace that with antidotes for the poison, which is positive self-talk, to work on giving yourself some encouragement. I was at a, um, speaking at a couple weeks ago at a workshop for families with kids with hemophilia, and, um, and I was setting up my computer, and I had forgotten to do something, and I said, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. And, and one of the mothers said, you know, that's really negative self-talk. I said, I hope you don't. She said, you know, I hope you don't say that to yourself very often. And I said, wow, you're right. I, I'll have to think about that. But you know, when, you, when you catch it in somebody else, um, you know, somebody's saying, you know, well, that's not going to work either, or, you know, I, it never works out, or, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to be disappointed, or, you know, it just sounds like a lot of work, to encourage them. Just, oh, you know, what if you said something positive to yourself? What if you turn that around very gently, even kind of make a joke out of it? When you catch that in other people, it helps you to catch it in yourselves also. And I say to my clients, give yourself a break. You're doing the best you can. Why be so hard on yourself all the time? You're dealing with a lot, right? You've got a lot, you got a lot going on. Here's one of my favorites is the 80-20 is the rule. <clears throat> and I, a few years ago, I was taking care of my mom. Um, um, I was in New York. She was in Michigan, and I was taking care of her. And I was there one weekend working with the nurses and the home health people, whatever. And um, you know, I was kind of, well, what about this? And what about that? What if that happens? And the nurse said, Gary, she said, how about the 80-20 rule? And I said, what do you mean? She said, how about? If we got things 80% right, how about if you let this be 80% of what it needs to be and maybe let 20% of it slide? How would, how, would that, how would life be if you could do that? So this is not going to be perfect. We're going to get it as good as we can. And you're not going to be perfect. You're going to get as good as you can. How about if you're able to settle with 80%? getting 80% done, and whether that's at home or the things you want to accomplish, and just lightened up on yourself a little bit. This is something you can point out in other people when you hear this micromanaging and this and, and sort of frustration and beating up on them, so, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and said, how, how about if we got things 80%? It might open up a whole new uh, world of, of lower stress. 
and dial it down. And this is something I say to myself and I say to my clients. We have a way, as humans, of creating catastrophes. Everything gets turned into, into a catastrophe and in our mind. And your body doesn't know the difference. So if you're dealing with a, a, a medical issue, a critical decision, <clears throat> your body goes on, on alert and says, oh my gosh, we got a big deal going on here. But if you make something simple, a crisis, your body doesn't know the difference. I used to have a client, um, she had very severe arthritis, and she would come to talk to me every Thursday at 11. Every Thursday at 11, that was her appointment. And Monday, I would get an email, are we on for Thursday? Yes. Tuesday, I would get another email, just double checking, yes. <laughs> Wednesday, I would get a text message, just double checking, yeah. Sometimes th Wednesday night, I might get another one. Just want to make sure, yeah, we're, we're on. We're really on. And I said to her, you know, what's up with that? And she said, well, you have to understand, I'm not in control of very much in my life. And I just, when I, I just have to know that everything's going to happen. And I said, look, I'm just a nice middle-aged guy. If you don't show up, I'm not going to charge you. I'm not going to yell at you. It's going to be OK. I'm going to check in on you to see if you're OK. Nothing bad is going to happen. What if you dial this down? I'm like a two, right? The choice about the new medication or, or when you have a big flare up, OK, that's a little higher. We've got to deal with it. I'm a two, maybe a one. How about if you dial it down where I'm concerned? Your body doesn't know the difference. Her body's on red alert. Oh my gosh, Thursday at 11. It doesn't need to be. Very quickly, I used to have an office on Wall Street. And every lunchtime, I would go down and get my lunch, my chicken wrap or whatever. And these guys would be down there. They're screaming into cell phones. You know, they're, what, 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 what? And, you know, they're down there. And, you know, the line's weaving towards, the, you know, get their chicken wrap. And um, the guy behind the counter would say, I just need one minute. We're out of salsa. What? You're running a business here? What is this? No salsa? What's this ridiculous? And I would be like, dude, it's a chicken wrap. These guys, his body doesn't know that he's not in the middle of the highway with eight lanes of traffic. The body thinks, oh my god, red alert here. It was just a chicken wrap, right? <laughs> Dude, come on. So Leave dial it down. Questions. Dial it down. Leave some space for questions. I'm sorry? Leave some space yes, for I will. Be very quick. Um, look for the humor, which we just did. Stop worrying about what other people think. You're dealing with a lot. We can't control other people. If somebody thinks you should be doing this or that, or you didn't do that right, let it go. Get support. You have a support network. Have some place to vent and to talk. Have a safe place where you can just go and say four-letter words and mean things and ugly things and let it out. <laughs> somebody who can listen, who's not going to try to judge you or fix you, but who can just listen. Let it out. It's there. And then pick yourself up and move on. Vent. You had a you had a, a session on spirituality, but it's, it's having some kind of a spiritual connection is an is an important part of resilience and gratitude. I I encourage my clients every morning when you get up, think of one thing that you're grateful for: hot coffee, a sunny day, something, and just seize on that the first thing in the in the morning. Have a vision. What do you want your life to look like? What's possible? And, what's, and, and, and what, what's realistic, but have a vision. Have something that you're working towards all the time, something that you're looking forward to. Today, tomorrow, next week, uh, again, a, a vision. Very quickly, because we've, we've already woven this through, watch out for stress. Watch out for signs of depression in yourself and in other people. Encourage other members, other people, to take care of themselves, body, mind, spirit. When the going gets tough, the tough go shopping, shrink shopping. So encourage members to reach out to a mental health professional and not to go through this alone, which I covered earlier on. I welcome you to get in touch with me. So I can, I can take a couple of questions, I think, and then you can shut me off if you need to. I'm here all afternoon. I have a question here. Uh, you talked about grief. You said everybody goes through grief, but there's no way that people can go around grief or something they have to go through. I think grief doesn't mean breaking down 
And it doesn't have to mean that. It, it means, uh, to me, the grief means, it means kind of integrating this new stage of life. And it might mean a lot of crying and a lot of emotions. It might just mean coming to an acceptance. Life is different. But it's, so the grief process is really the process of talking through it and integrating and, 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 and getting, starting the next chapter. It's a very good question. Yeah, but everybody experiences it differently. What do you think of the various techniques that are available now, such as yoga and uh, Tai Chi Chi and things like that, which are supposed to ease your mind? Yes. And they even use it in some hospitals, I hear. Yeah, absolutely. I do a lot of mindfulness meditation with my clients, which is kind of the diaphragmatic breathing. But there's a lot of new complementary um, approaches that are really helping people. Yoga, um, Tai Chi and things that are more body, mind, spirit oriented because it's not just talk therapy that helps heal. It's really, you're he kind of healing your mind and, and almost like a spiritual healing. And the meditation can be very calming and relaxing which can promote wellness also. And there's more and more research about that. John Kabat-Zinn you might be familiar with, does a lot of meditation with cancer patients and has really seen the positive effect of, of meditation and, and yoga and just spiritual techniques like that for healing, for wellness. Yeah, good question, thank you. Should have mentioned that, yeah. Anything else? Gary, uh, I think one of the, the most important distinctions I've discovered here this week is there's, there's, we're talking about two things that happen in support groups. One is treating, and most of our support groups focus on treating. We don't necessarily focus enough on healing. And I really thank you for what you presented today. Oh, thank you. And I, and I hope to, uh, to take that back to my support group and say, let's talk about healing. Let's talk about uh, the softer side of this. And we don't have to get in a circle and cry and kumbaya, but there's, no. some, there's some stuff here that, that needs to come out. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Th thank you for a great uh, discussion. Uh, a comment and a question. A comment is in the vocabulary of cancer, we always hear the word battle, battling cancer, which is a red alert, in my mind, hypervigilant state. So I I'm a little bit reluctant to go along with that uh, mindset because especially with prostate cancer, you're just exhausted if you're spending 10 years on the, on the front line. Exactly, and you might, you might have noticed in one of my slides, I said, give up the battle because this just leads to more of this, absolutely. And I often tell my clients that we talk about cancer as a fight and we talk about this battle which sent, sets up the idea that we're at war and that we're often at war with ourselves, battling for control. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a middle road, which is, which is acceptance and taking the best possible care of yourself and being optimistic and doing what you need to do to, to make yourself better, to, to, to be as healthy as possible. A question, how do you, what are strategies for approaching the imminent death conversation? I think, I think it's part of the plan B, I think, is to start to talk about if this happened, if that were to happen, is, is to start to be aware of if, if the treatment didn't work, if things worsened, if, and, to, and to start that conversation. I think part of it is to have, uh, can be a start out with a practical discussion about here are things that we would start to get ready for, and, and, and make, I think, help family members to know that they can start talking about fears and concerns that they have as well, and sharing, you know, sharing memories, and, and um, I think emotionally and spiritually preparing for those conversations, if, if they have to happen at some point, or when, when they happen. I, for our 13 years, I think maybe regarding, I'm over here, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, should I stand up? <laughs> I think regarding the battle, which Dr. Shellhammer referred to, and versus the letting go, maybe they're just both true. And there's just different seasons to this journey. Our yeah, journey was yeah. 13 years, and there was diff definitely different seasons. But being sensitive to the fact that maybe the season's changing, yeah. and there's different places in the journey, um, maybe they're both true, and neither one cancels the other out. And that's uh -huh. part of just being OK with where you are and living yeah. in it, and, and giving yourself permission to feel it, live it, and do it the best you can. 
It's being a fighter, exactly. A peaceful warrior. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, let's thank Gary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.